Welcome back to What's New with Mead. Today I have a very fun guest. I have Charles from DIY Fermentation on the podcast to chat about his channel, about him as a person, and really just dig deeper into uh, his brewing world. So Charles, thank you so much for uh, meeting with me. I'm so excited to have you here. Well, once again, as I said earlier, it is a great honor to be host <laughs> on your podcast. I do appreciate it. Hey, well, I, you know, I think we're gonna have some fun. Um, I want to really, I want to start off by asking you about your personal brewing experience. When did you get started? Like, how long have you been brewing? Well, I started, uh, I started brewing almost two years ago. In fact, it's uh, two, uh, two weeks shy of two years ago. Ah. I, made, I made my first batch of, of wine. And I don't know how this is going to look on camera, but basically, oh yeah, that was my first batches of wine experience. Hey, that's not bad at all, though. <laughs> at least you had airlocks. Yeah, that was an improvement uh, on my uh, vi- on my very second video when I when I had my very first uh, wine making video. Uh, I was teaching people how if they don't have airlocks, just simply lo- uh, use the uh, loose cap method. And uh, maybe it works, but uh, yeah, I decided to, you know, look professional and get some airlocks. And uh, that was, that was batch number one. Yeah. Well, that's funny. So I just am working on a video that's uh, essentially that people like people who want to brew, but don't want to buy equipment. And so same idea. I, I had, I brewed something in a one gallon jug and I literally just, took a knife and punctured a small hole on the top, put cheesecloth over the top, punctured a small hole so it could breathe some. And it's a great way to start, you know? And like you said, it's a step up. Airlocks are the next step and really you just keep going up and up and up. Well, um, again, uh, no, wait. Oh, you go ahead. Guess. I was about to say, yeah, the whole, uh, the whole uh, principle of my channel, of course, is, uh, is my channel is designed specifically for those users who have absolutely no experience with winemaking whatsoever might be put off by the fact that if they're going to make a professional wine kit, they're going to need, you know, X, Y, and Z ingredients, and they're going to need this equipment and all of that. And that might stop some people from at least making the effort of getting started. So yeah. the whole purpose of my channel is to start as simple as possible, see, what, see if it works. And if it does work, you can take it on from there. I love that. That is awesome. So that kind of leads me into some more questions about your personal brewing. Uh, what kind of alcohol do you find yourself brewing most at this point? Are you a wine guy? I know you've been doing some meads recently. Doing a lot of meads recently. Um, <laughs> don't know why. <laughs> no, uh, I'm a wine guy. Uh, if only for the simple reason that uh, the ingredients for making a batch of wine are far less than the ingredients for making meat, i.e. the price of honey. And even when I'm using the, uh, I won't say the least expensive honey uh, that I can find, it's still kind of pricey. So I, I try and uh, uh, space out my mead making uh, uh, whenever I can. But uh, yeah, between wine, mead, and beer, I think I've only made one batch of beer. Okay. Uh, and I'd like to do more of that, but I just haven't had time to go back and do it. Right. Yeah, beer is, um, when I first started, I really wanted to start brewing a lot of beer. And I, I'm a not a very good cook. And I get overwhelmed by the amount of ingredients required to cook. So every time I do, I'm like, I'm like a four ingredient kind of person. So beer had, you know, it it has at least five or six things to get yourself going. Um, Mm -hmm. And so I was like, ah, this is too hard. So that's why I started doing mead because at its base value, it is honey, water, yeast. I was like, I could do that. Water is pretty much free. Yeast and honey, I can find. So I, I love getting to do wines. I don't do them much on my channel, but when I do uh, make them, I, it's a lot of fun. And I've yet to experiment outside of the kits, wine kit world, but <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm still very basic. I have apparently on my channel lately, I have no hesitation to experiment with anything. Uh, uh-huh. I think my, la- my last two, the applesauce wine, uh, uh, video and the cranberry sauce wine video. Oh man, uh, the sky's the limit. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, I think that's a lot of fun though. <clears throat> um, I love getting to do those experiments, and I'm, I mean that's one of my things on my channel is can it be a mead, and then the other should it be a mead. So those are just a fun, <laughs> fun sides yeah. of the coin. <laughs> So you're brewing mostly wine at this point, yes. and you said a little bit of mead here and there now, not much beer. 
Are you leaning towards any styles in specific or are you just kind of all over the board at this point? Uh, pretty much all over the board. I'd have to say at this point, um, um, no, I, I can't say that I have a basic style. I mean, I mean, as you said before, both wine and meat making are still basically the same ingredients. Wine, sugar, yeast, wine, honey, yeast. And then you can make variations from there. And uh, mm-hmm. uh, I don't want to adopt a specific style because I don't want to, uh, uh, and I've had this come up, I have some of my viewers say that uh, uh, because they're following me so intently that... <laughs> <laughs> that uh, uh, they're wondering if I want to go in this direction or, or in that direction to expand uh, 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 my offerings. And I have to try and keep telling people that, no, that's not what this channel is designed for. It is not a progression of winemaking abilities. It's a stepping stone. Mm-hmm. And once you've got that first step, you can move on to, I don't know, channels like Man Made Mead or Oh My Bank Channel or, you know, stuff like that. <laughs> and uh, in, 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 in the further progression of winemaking capabilities. Okay. Yeah. No, I, I really like that. And I think, um, so one of the things I find interesting about YouTube and I look, I look at all my popular videos and I'm sure you can look at yours too and see that the, the most popular things are beginner based recipes videos. Mm-hmm. Um, and because there's just so many people who, who want to try it. And I think lots of people don't take that step forward. So people like you who are continuing to provide the beginner recipe basics are, you're going to bring more people into the hobby than someone like me who uh, I kind of dive off the deep end real fast and start talking about, you know, level 10 brewing instead of <laughs> always focusing on level one. So I think that's important to have people like you in our world to continue to make this grow. It's important. Well, I think uh, considering the relative sizes of our audience uh, and I won't, I won't name uh, other channels because <laughs> all of that, but uh, no, you're 30 plus thousand uh, subscribers. Uh, you're doing quite well. Uh, I didn't expect to get over 10,000 well, when I first started. Uh, that really was not my goal uh, when, I, when I first started. Uh, and if there are other YouTube channels out there or YouTube YouTubers who are aspiring to get into uh, YouTube, whatever your, 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 uh, your channel content is, you just need to stick with it. And if you've got interesting content, people will eventually find you out. Yeah. And it's, it is a grind, you know, you, uh, I think you can attest yeah. to this too. It is, yeah. um, there are moments when you're like, you post a video and it might not <laughs> re- get as, it's not as received like you thought it would. And you're like, oh, I just spent like, you know, two months on this thing, but it, it is a grind and you just got to keep going. And eventually hard work does, does pay off. And you're right. Uh, there are some videos or some stretches of time where, yeah, I was kind of just grinding up the videos, just, mm-hmm. just. If nothing else, it gives you additional experience. Uh, I'm more relaxed in my videos these days than some of my earlier videos. Mm-hmm. Uh, so it's just a question of just gaining experience, gaining composure, just being relaxed and, and having fun with your videos. Yeah. Oh, it's so important. I mean, this hobby should be fun. I think at the, the point where if you're making meat or wine or beer and you are so stressed out about that, that it is altering your life in a greater way, you should probably step back and go, hold on. I, am I having fun yet? <laughs> <laughs> I remember watching a video not that long ago about one YouTuber who was uh, making their 199th uh, or approaching their 200. Yeah. I watched that video. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's a, uh, it, <clears throat> I've, I've been on the grind. That's, that is no doubt about that. So, mm. so I want to ask you about, in all of your experience, you know, us talking about how many we've, uh, wines, beers, meads we've made. What is your, like, without spoiling, I don't know if you'd like to give the recipe or whatever. What's like your, your best recipe, your go-to, I brew this all the time, uh, wine or mead or beer? Well, there is, there are two uh, go-to recipes. Uh, the apple wine is probably, uh, because it's the easiest to make, it's the cheapest to make, and the results, it's kind of hard to mess up, quite honestly. Um, um, following that would probably be the uh, blackberry, no, the dark cherry wine and mead. Uh, oh, both of oh. those have, they're kind of hard to mess up. They, they, yeah. they just, they're just easy to make and they just, they just work. Uh, everything else, uh, they're nice. Uh, there are quite a few that there are a few <laughs> that I will make again on a regular basis, uh, larger uh-huh. batches. But right now, I don't have the time and capacity to uh, uh, produce larger batches because I have to make 
batches of wine, one gallon batches of wine for my channel. And uh, with the making of the batches, uh, the biggest two problems that I have there are storage. Yes. Trying to store the carboys and coming up with, with the necessary wine bottles to, uh, <clears throat> to then store them in that. So storage is, is pretty much the issue, which is probably why this month you haven't seen me making. No, I take that back. <laughs> I try to reduce. <laughs> I try to reduce what I'm making. Uh, uh, maybe once or twice a month. And the rest of it just uh, tastings or whatever. Yeah. Oh, okay, I have a question about um, your apple wine. So one, uh, I you know, I'm, it's funny. I'm drinking an apple, little apple cinnamon mead right now. Just <laughs> as something I've I think I've gotten pretty good at. When you are making your wine, are you? using apple juice in the base um, as your main thing? Do you use apples, like real apples? What is your apple introduction to that? Uh, I would prefer, well, using the apple juice is probably the easiest way to go because you've got mm -hmm. just 100% juice and you're not watering it down with anything. Uh, you've got straight flavor. When you're using apples, fresh apples, uh, I've had a progression in terms of how to process the apples because they don't have an apple press. And I'm quite sure most of my viewers are not going to have an apple press handy. Right. Um, I went from going from chunks to, to shredding it to that applesauce gave me some interesting ideas. Now, more than <laughs> likely, they'll just go in a food processor or a blender so I can extract as much juice as possible and put them in a straining bag and go that route. But yeah, uh, yeah I, I, I try not to water it down if, if at all possible. So have you noticed post primary when you ferment with apple juice um i mean obviously fermentation changes things have you noticed a a great uh loss in apple character when using juice it depends on the quality of the juice that you're using mm -hmm. if you're using a brand name apple juice not so much yeah. When you are on my channel using Brand X, yeah, you, you notice there's a big difference. Uh, when you're using fresh apples, not so much. Mm -hmm. uh, I think the last batch of fresh apples that I did was a Granny Smith apple wine video. And even though that was, I didn't get very much juice extraction and it was pretty much watered down quite a bit, uh, the flavor of the Granny Smith apples came through. Uh, okay. So, yeah, speaking of apples. <laughs> hey. There we go. Nice. <laughs> this one, That's... I don't know how uh, how it escaped. This is this is made back in November of last year. This should have been bottled yeah. by now and, and, and done with. But uh, it's going to allow me to have an experiment with an issue that I've come up with, with trying to pasteurize uh, needs. Uh, we can talk about that later, but uh, yeah. it's going to be a subject of an upcoming video. Yeah. I want to circle back to that in a second yeah. uh, because I, I have a question. I think it was on, on our list um, of questions, but so on that apple note, because I, I find this really fascinating. I've done this apple mead recipe a bunch and I've experimented a bunch of different ways. I've done, you know, water base and then three to four pounds of apples. I've done mm -hmm. apple juice alone. I've done apple juice and apples. Uh, most recently I've been experimenting with apple juice base and then getting apple juice concentrate and putting that in to provide a little more of that character. In every instance, I find um, issues in that that apple character gets blown off so much. Now, like you said, I'm not using the, the uh, sprouts, you know, apple juice, whatever <laughs> their thing they have. I'm using the great value or the Mott's or whatever the, the brand is. So mm -hmm. I just, I wanted to know from your experience, how do you bring that apple character back once you've lost it? Um, it you can bring it back during your rackings. <clears throat> mm -hmm. You know, you're going you're gonna to lose a certain amount. Of, you're going to lose a certain amount of head space every time you rack, okay? About a quarter of an inch at this point. <laughs> right, right. Uh, and instead of just, just, grabbing, uh, just grabbing a cup of water and, water and just reducing the head space, I now use the actual juice tables two ways. One, I will either use uh, the apple, in this case, apple juice, I'll just simply bring the level up that, that, that way, or in, in some of my videos, I've been uh, trying to tell my users that uh, when you're making the initial production of, of your primary ingredients, make about a cup or two extra. Mm -hmm. And then when you do your racking, freeze the remaining. And then okay, when you do, yeah. and, and, they, and when you do subsequent rackings, just start out, add it in. 
so you're not losing a lot of character. So are you kind of on that note of pasteurizing? Are you pasteurizing prior to doing that? Or when you rack, are you putting it in? Uh, pasteurization doesn't occur until the very end. Uh, I'll, I'll back sweeten first and then pasteurize. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, with wines, the process works quite well. It's a very simple process. Once, once you learn how to do it, you can boil water and, and, and look at a thermometer. You're right. good. Um, and I'll talk about it. The problem with meads, though, is that when you pasteurize it, so you get this, you can see it, you're going to end up with a lot of the honey solids separating out. Yeah. Uh -huh. um, I have a solution to that. Oh, okay. <laughs> that is an upcoming video. Uh, All right. It's a very simple solution. I don't know why I didn't think of it before, but yeah, yeah I'm going to do that. When I, when I rack this one, probably next week, uh, in past, I'm sorry, when I pasteurize it, back sweet and pasteurize it, uh, this would be the subject of the video as to how to eliminate. I mean, it's perfectly fine. You can scroll it up and, and, and drink it if you want, but I prefer my wine to be there. <laughs> yes, yes. So, uh, so yeah, um, yeah. Uh, more on that to come. Yeah. Well, okay, so let's let's talk about this. Um, you said you started two about two years ago at this point. Yeah. What kind of got you started into brewing? Well, at the time I was retired, mm -hmm. happily retired. Uh, but the hobby that I I uh, started initially, which was programming or doing um, uh, Android application programming, uh, wasn't really turning out all that well. I mean, you're putting in a lot of work for very little return. Uh, so then I remembered something that my father did uh, mm -hmm. 30, 40 years ago, really. Uh, he was making those little wine making kits. And yep. uh, I didn't think much of it at the time. I mean, he had me tasting it from time to time, but you know, like drinking wine after about a month or so. It's like, okay, I don't get it. Uh, and, forgot, to and totally forgot about it. Um, sitting around thinking of something else to do, I decided to go ahead and give it a try. If my dad could do it, why can't I? So I'm watching all of the videos, all of the early videos, in terms of how to make wine, <laughs> and uh, decided to give it a shot. Uh, after making my first batches, I was drinking them after about three or four weeks. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, surprised that I was able to make you know, alcohol for the most part, uh, but also surprised by the amount of sediment, <laughs> yeah. the, the, yeast, the <clears throat> yeast that you have at that point in time. And that's when I began realizing, okay, why don't I just start letting it age a little bit longer? Wait a few more weeks, wait a few more weeks. And uh, yeah, for me, that was actually the hardest part of my, of this hobby, was just learning how to wait for your wine to, to, oh, to yeah. age. Uh -huh. Oh, I agree. I, that is, um, I always, everyone who asks, uh, it feels like a, <laughs> like a silly thing to say, but like, like, what advice would you give? And I always say something like, you know, make more mead. And it, it sounds like a cop out, you know, just answer. But if you don't, you're just sitting there watching paint dry. I mean, it's it is pretty pretty boring. So making more. Well, I don't know. Going? This, this is interesting for time. To time. <laughs> even, <laughs> yeah. that, even that gets tiresome after a while. <laughs> yeah. No. So I definitely think oh, you're right. Making more not only entertains you, but then you know you just get more experience. So that's mm -hmm. super super helpful. You talked about yeast. Do you have a specific yeast you go to for most things at this point? Yeah, I'm a, I'm a Red Star man. So okay. basically, so my go-to yeast is, is the Red Star Premier Blanc. Okay, yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm trying to get away from that because of the uh, high alcohol tolerance it has, and I'm trying to shift down to some of the lower brands like uh, uh, Coupe des Blanc, Premier Coupe des Blanc. Uh-huh, yeah. Because, of the, because I've learned that it's not the alcohol that's the appealing part of the winemaking. Well, it is to a point, but it's really, it's, it's really the flavor of the wine and the alcohol, high alcohol content, 18, 16, 18%, just tracks away from that quite a bit to the point where it's not really a, I don't want, I can't say pleasurable experience because it's going to end up being a, but yeah. it, 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 it kills some of the flavor of the wine. And uh, that's not really what I'm after these days. One of those um, red stars, I can't remember which one goes, it's, the tolerance is 13, you know, air quotes yeah, about 13. I don't remember which one it is, but one yeah, of them is lower. Is that one? Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, well, that's kind of nice. I mean, that's lower for most wine yeast. I, mean, I feel like the, the bottom of the barrel for like 
most wine yeast is 14. So finding one that can go to 13 is, is well, nice. it'd be kind of nice if it stopped at 13, but uh, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. In my experience, uh, the, uh, ABD tolerances are more of a, uh, guesstimation or yeah, I, I simply say guesstimation because, uh, they've always, always gone beyond that. Yeah. And there's really, there's really not much you can do about it. That's true. Um, have you noticed that, I'm sure you do use, you have to use some nutrients, especially when mead making. Do you have to use much nutrient additions when it comes to wine making? I know it's obviously a different animal. What? Other than raisins? I mean, I don't understand. <laughs> <laughs> that's all you need. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's all I thought I needed initially. And then I did the research and uh, uh, realized that raisins are not a, will not impact much nutritional value on the yeast. It will give you just a little bit. Uh, but no, I've given up on, on raisins as, as a nutritional value, as a supplement. And uh, now I just simply go without. Uh, okay. if, a recipe, if a recipe calls for raisins, uh, for flavor uh, characteristics or to change the profile, I'll, I'll put the raisins in the recipe. But now I stipulate that uh, uh, it's not as a yeast nutrient uh, approach to doing, uh, to doing it. So no, I don't use, uh, don't use anything at this point. Okay. Yeah. Well, and I think winemaking is a little different because you do have a base um, nutritional value coming from sources, you know, especially with grapes. You know, they, there is a need for some nutrient, but there's more so nutrient in that grape must than there would be in honey must. And so I think that's an important thing to note. I just didn't know if you were a fermate oak person or K or anything like that. No, I'm not, but uh, I'm not against the use of any of those products. And I try and let that be known in my videos. Uh, uh, just because I don't use it, that does not mean that you should use it. You can actually end up with a better product, probably using, using the uh, nutritional ingredients than you are just by going it alone. And I make that quite clear. But then again, considering the grocery store approach, you can't really find Fermato or Dapper or any of that at the grocery store. So mm -hmm. I'd rather they put someone off because they might think that they have to have this. Uh, I'd simply just go without. You have you come up oh, go ahead. Sorry. No, I was just going to conclude by simply saying you can come up with, in many cases, a, a fairly good tasting product. Have you tried using bread yeast previously? Yes, I have. And I've done videos, two videos. One, the actual making of the bread. Uh, uh, oh, wait a minute. Bread yeast. Instead of like, yeast. like, sorry. Yeah. Uh, well, sorry, let me, let me re, re step back. So bread yeast as a yeast nutrient, not, not bread I, for fermenting, but I know, yeast nutrient. I know what you mean. And no, I have not tried that, uh, um, uh, yet. <laughs> I, mm -hmm. I just haven't had time really. Um, yeah. uh, <laughs> really, I haven't had the time to try it. Uh, it might come up sometime in the future. It's not planned on anytime soon uh, but yeast uh, yeast holes dead yeast holes and things of that nature uh, things that you can probably get your hands on uh, anywhere uh, I might give it a shot in as a comparison video between using that using the yeast and and not using it uh, to see if there's any effect on on, on fermentation or, or, or quality of the product but uh, in that I've not had any problems with stuck fermentations with anything that I've made so far uh, uh, I've really been kind of hesitant to, to start deploying these additional products because uh, things just seem to work the way we are. Right. Yeah, I understand that. I understand. I, I asked about the boiled bread yeast because I know that's, um, that's obviously a, a grocery store fix for if that problem arises is to throw some of that in. I haven't done an A-B test to know if, you know, what, what is bread yeast, boiled bread yeast stack up against Fermate. Oh, that sounds like a fun video. I might have to do that in the future, but who knows? Well, I yeah, but I've also had the limitation that my wine, uh, my channel is not a technical winemaking channel. Yeah. So uh, when it comes down to people asking me, well, why aren't you using DAP? Or what could you use, uh, make comparisons? Or, or uh, how are you accurate? That question is one of yours. Accurately determine your pH levels in your wines and uh, your tannin levels. And only, uh, I, don't, I don't involve myself with that to any great degree. Uh, what does happen uh, is that after the initial video has been made, uh, using whatever ingredients that I have listed in the description section of the video, once I've had a chance to do the wine tastings, then I can go ahead, go back and make adjustments to the original recipe ingredients. And I used to do that. Yeah. And a lot of people know that uh, in the original video, you'll see the words modified and the paper that I modified on it to know that I made these changes. 
and yeah. uh, and that's pretty much my approach to it. Uh, doing a doing a, a wine making video or doing a uh, making wine, and then uh, making all the changes and then doing a video on that uh, on that uh, wine. I, I don't have time for that. I, yeah. I, and now that I'm in my mid sixties, I don't have time for that. <laughs> <laughs> hey, that's fair though. That's, that's fair. Uh, uh, no, I think it's um, it is. For your channel, you don't want to, especially don't want to overwhelm people. I think that's where pe lots of people get really turned off from brewing is because uh, it, it does become a more complex thing. And there are there are some people who who love the challenge of taking you know eight or nine ingredients and throwing them in, and some people just want to throw the the basic four and just let it go and not really have to think too hard. And that's not neither side is wrong by any means. It's more so just like how much, how much do you want to invest into it? So I think your channel is yeah, helpful for that. Yeah. I'm going to add to that by simply saying that when my channel first started, I think I mentioned this earlier to you in the, uh, uh, uh great meat project uh, that, um, my channel originally was supposed to have been a progression, just like most other wine channels out there. Um, uh, my journey from step one to step Z, but, the very first time that I started uh, using sulfites and, and, and all of this and the other, I started getting comments from some of my viewers saying, your stuff just got too complicated. Uh, mm. it's, not, it's not as much fun as it was before. And that stopped me in my tracks. And I haven't changed since. Yeah. Um, uh, but yeah, my earlier videos, uh, I think my first three or four, uh, yeah, I was, I was adding sulfite, you know, adding picking enzymes and adding sulfites and more sulfites and uh, stabilizing with more sulfites. Uh, I don't do that yeah. anymore. No, that's fair. I totally understand that. And, and there is a, a definite need for that because the the whole home brewing population, um, we especially wine mead making, we want it to grow. And there are, um, you know, I, I did a video a while back about this, the three kind of big mead community things that we experienced. And one of those was we have a uh, break between brewers and some people we have more, I'm, I'm going to say natural mead makers, wine makers who are like, uh, don't even hand me a sulfite sorbate, you know, anything like that. Cause I don't want to do that. And then the other side who are comfortable and we need to have uh, the ability to, have people who can do both and you are you are absolutely helping this side of the fence now i have nothing against not using those things uh, my channel just ends up using them more so than obviously yours <laughs> well uh i was gonna make light of the fact that my side is dominated not one of the leaders of the pack. I won't even mention channel names. Okay, <laughs> I'll just let it go. We know who we're talking about. Okay, <laughs> if not, I'll say it. Yeah, but but uh, no, um, no, that was the approach that uh, had appealed to me when I was watching all of the earlier winemaking channels. Uh, uh, my channel is based loosely on that on that same principle uh, of simply doing it uh, on, uh, as natural as possible. Uh, uh, I don't want to really go down that particular road too far, but I'll just simply say, yeah, uh, you're right. There is a certain, I don't say, it is kind of a hard dividing line between us naturalists and. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. It's not a great word for it, but yeah. <laughs> and, and you guys, you know. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I think that's all I'm going to say. Yeah. Okay. So let's talk about some, um, adjustments then we're, we're kind of on that topic okay when you get to let's say you make you just mentioned that you talk about uh the change in recipes when you post a video you know the beginning you post the recipe and then you say you know uh i don't remember what word you said but you know adjustment or some sort how do you adjust things like acid balance when you're making a wine let's like say make just a basic grape wine and you want to adjust the acid what are you going to do generally speaking um with acid levels again uh going from a whole lemon juice to a half a lemon to now a quarter of a lemon which is again the sweet spot that i found for most of my wines 
Uh, that is the adjustment that I make. Uh, is that per gallon or is that? That, that is per gallon. Uh, okay. Breaking out uh, pH strips or pH meters. Um, don't see that happening. It's not on my channel. I mean, uh, it would be great if I were doing that on my, my own personal wines, uh, which there are some uh, processes that I do use on my own personal wines that I don't use on the channel. Uh, but then again, I mean, uh, just because my channel is a stepping stone, it does not mean that I'm stuck. <laughs> yeah, no, I get it. Yeah. <laughs> so, the, yeah. do you ever use, um, uh, like, is it exclusively lemons? Have you experimented doing limes? Have you found any use for limes or anything like that? I have not found any use for limes. Uh, I think the only one that I actually used lime, no, two that I did lime, uh, limes with was a lemon lime wine. Mm -hmm. And I think a coconut wine, I think I used limes. Uh, oh, the lemon lime, the lemon lime wine. <laughs> I mean, it was okay, you know, but I don't yeah. see myself as making it again, sort of thing. And uh, usually, when I do my taste testings, if it's something that's that's dubious, uh, I let my people know. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm not the sort that's going to say that everything that I make is great, you know, just so I can say everything is great. I don't want you to know up front. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> anymore. <laughs> I, just, I, just, I pour this one down the drain, sort of thing, which I have done. <laughs> Yeah. Um, so that that's great. I love, I've used lemon in, what did I use then? I had a, I did a, uh, about a year ago now, I started it and it finished the video and all this stuff anyways. It was a wild yeast mead that used snow water and uh, yeast from blueberries that I had gotten. And then I adjusted tan the, not tannin, but acid with some lemon juice kind of in post and it turned out really nice i the one thing i do note is of course it lemon juice is going to naturally add a little bit of discernible flavor but it is not so much that like it is going to mess anything up i would say right right uh, i agree uh the flavor is more discernible in, in the white ones that i make in the reds not so much uh so I think I can get away. I can get away with the, with the uh, new quantity of lemon juice that I'm, I'm currently adding, uh, so that it does not overwhelm the wine. Which has happened from time to time. Yeah, but uh, I, agree. I agree. Are you always um, are you always juicing lemons to do this, or have you ever used like store bought lemon juice? Uh, uh, I always use fresh lemons. I only did. Uh, there's another product out there called True Lemon, which is nothing more than just crystallized lemon juice. I did use that in one of my videos, one of my strawberry wine videos, first ones. Uh, but I stopped doing that because I began realizing again, uh, more than likely you're going to find a lemon before you're going to find True Lemon in a box. Uh, so again, that just brought it back to be keeping a simple approach. Yeah, that's great. I love that. Uh, let's talk about tannin now. So the other kind of balancing agent, um, Obviously, grape juice, or I'm not saying grape juice, juices um, provide some tannic value in their own right. How are you adjusting tannin? Are you an oaking kind of person? Are you using other adjuncts? Uh, I do have oak chips, and I have tried that. Um, I'm still experimenting with, uh, with oak chips in terms of um, – at what point, uh, at what stage in the process to go ahead and add them, how long you should add them uh, to the level of uh, tannin that uh, you prefer. Overall, I'm not really a big tannin person. Uh, I can do without I can do without tannin and, and be perfectly happy. But uh, mm -hmm. if uh, if the original recipe that I that I source calls for tannin, uh, then I'll go ahead and add it in. Uh, but it, but uh, the black tea method uh, has generally worked fairly well. Which is, uh, I, I'm not familiar. Oh, uh, basically, just boil about a half a cup of black tea. And uh, so simply add that to the mix. And that gives you okay. a pretty good uh, tannin. It's a pretty good tannin substitute. But uh, I, I now find that uh, where I, whereas I was originally telling people just take an arbitrary amount of water and, and, and boil, it, you know, boil it with your tea, uh, I'm now beginning to make adjustments to, okay, maybe a quarter of a cup would be preferable to you know, half a cup. Uh, mm -hmm. to keep the tannin levels at a, at a lower level. Again, everything is trial and error. Why make yeah. things trial and error? Uh, yes. There is no, uh, well, I do have one or two perfect recipes, but uh, for the most part, even a perfect recipe, if you can follow it to the letter, will change. Uh, 
there's there's no way to exactly duplicate a, a given recipe. So yeah, I try and t uh, try and tell people on my channel that uh, for the most part, uh, this is just a start. And once you've got your, it's like any other recipe, food or whatever. Uh, once you've got read the ingredients and you tried it and you realize, okay, I can make an adjustment here and I make an adjustment here. Same thing for wine and meat making. There's no difference. Yeah. That's so interesting you talked about um, <clears throat> uh, black tea for tannin because I, I did the experiment. I started it, it was maybe a half year, or about a year ago. I did a Tupelo mead and I adjusted tannin in the primary of one of them, I added about, there's either one or two cups of black tea, which now that I'm in hindsight, I'm going, it's a lot of tea. <laughs> I, I, um, I think I, that's part of the realization with that, that video is that I used too much tea. And then the other half was I used like powdered wine tannin that you can purchase at homebrew stores. And it's just like essentially, uh, I mean, dried, what is it called? Crap. I, I, now my brain is blanking. It's, it is a purchasable, purchasable way to alter tannic value. And I did both of them side by side, did a taste test. I think what I learned is the black tea amount that I used is too much, especially now that you're saying, you know, half a cup per gallon or quarter cup per gallon. I'm going, holy cow, I think I, <laughs> I just went way too far with it. So that, that makes me want to revisit that experiment again and try and do it in a um, with you know lower quantity <laughs> i'm sure it'd help the tannic value some so let's talk about um pasteurizing we kind of teased we were going to talk about this earlier uh obviously your your channel is not going to use sorbates or metabisulfites because they're they are what they are and um the pasteurizing method for me is I enjoy doing it until I get to larger batches. What is your recommended pasteurizing method for people in that one gallon state? Let's say. If they're, if they're using one gallon and we're talking about wines, then basically uh, do the pasteurization in the bottles themselves. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, that's the quickest and easiest method to do it. Uh, if we're talking about one gallon batches, which will be the subject of an upcoming video. Um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> seriously, um, especially with needs. Um, I'm still working out the logistics of that, but basically the process is still the same. Uh, uh, cardboard goes in the pot, add water, insert your thermometer, wait for the temperature to come up, you're uh -huh. done. That's all there is. So here's my question. How do you, when you're in bottles, and let's say you're doing wine bottles, are you mm -hmm. pasteurizing the corked bottles or no. are you okay no uh, basically you're covering the bottles with uh, an, an aluminum cap just mm -hmm. to place aluminum foil cap just, you know, just wrap it around the side right and that's basically it that's pretty much just to keep uh, the moisture without losing a lot through, uh, through evaporation um and if there's any even though you're not really approaching the, the evaporation point of alcohol uh, by any means uh, if any should uh, should uh, evaporate, uh, that's trapped by the cap and it simply uh, filters back down. Are you going low and slow, like one one forty for twenty minutes? Or are you going high uh, and I'm, fast? I'm going high and fast, which is why you really need to keep an eye on that thermometer. Uh, once it hits one sixty five, uh, you got about about fifteen seconds is what the recommendation that I saw was. Oh wow! Uh, uh, as long as you keep it under one seventy four, uh, where I think uh, the uh, uh, Evaporation point of alcohol begins. Mm -hmm. uh, you're okay. Yeah. So if you 15, forget about it, if, wow. If you forget about it and and, and, and you do, and it just go up. I wonder if you can have a a, a non-alcoholic wine <laughs> produce <laughs> that point. <one. laughs> yeah. So have you have you done any pasteurizing larger than one gallon at this point? No. Uh, and that's limited by by virtue of the fact that uh, I can only acquire so many wine bottles at a time. And basically, that's whatever I consume. Once I've got my, my necessary five bottles, then I can go ahead and bottle another batch of wine. Uh, and that's where that, that's a tough thing. Is like I, I've hesitated to do a lot of pasteurizing when I get to larger batches because it's hard to do that. You know, like you said, getting enough wine bottles. But let's say you have enough wine bottles, mm -hmm. you would have to do multiple 
batches of pasteurizing. So, you know, in your pot, you can only fit seven. Yeah. And, and maximum. Yeah. Well, yeah. Uh, yeah. It all comes down, I guess, to the size of your pot. Uh, yeah. But if you've got it like a three gallon batch or a five gallon batch, I guess would be the, uh, be the standard. Uh, uh, I have no real solution to that other than simply breaking it down uh, and doing them in and doing them in relays. So one batch, then one batch, then one batch. Yeah. Um, Which I would caution people. I, I made the mis mistake. Um, <clears throat> the other, I, I don't think it's as bad with wine bottles cause they might be better, but I had a, a half gallon container of honey essentially. And I was trying to just heat it up some and I was being a real dummy and I just threw it right into the hot water and that air expanded, of course, without me thinking about it, and that busted. Obviously, in a wine bottle, you're not going to have as much air to expand. And that's why you do the cap. You know, you do the, like you're saying, the foil cap so that if air expands, it does leave. This was my dumb, uh, dumb <laughs> self was, was leaving that? a cap on. <laughs> <laughs> Getting close. Get, get, get yeah. Close. <laughs> no um, monetization for you. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, so, um, I guess what my point of that is if you're heating up honey, make sure you go slower, you know, and you would probably want to leave the cap off like you do with the foil. I might give, I might give that a try, that method a try to see if that might also reduce the amount of sediment that will filter out from the uh, honey solids to see if that might do it. Uh, I might try both approaches. Uh, the go and slow approach, I know another channel uh, does it that way, and I didn't really want to do it that way. In fact, I don't want to do my winemaking uh, the way any other channel makes theirs because you know, I want to be different and, right. and remain that way. But uh, uh, go and slow, I'm not sure if that might change the equation or not. That'd be an interesting. Um, uh, obviously, your channel still cater to to basic brewers, but that would be that could be an interesting video for somebody to do. You or any, anybody um, doing a low, taking one bottle, doing it low and slow, doing your kind of high heat but not too fast, and then like a flash pasteurize method. The thing about, and this is about my wine, uh, my videos in general. Um, my, my, my videos break down into three separate scenes, one on the dining room table, two over the kitchen <laughs> stove and three over yeah. the sink. The kitchen stove sequences, I can't, I, I do test a little past. Yeah. It's, it's a huge house. I got a, I have a tiny little kitchen and trying to set up lights, tripod and, and, and camera and all of that equipment angled over the stove, you know, and with, with all the condensation coming up. Over, and, and you have to do it for a while. I mean, I can't just, I try and edit out the, the, the time it takes to boil the water so that you see me pouring in the water just so you see me doing it and then put the cover on and then next thing you know, pop up. There's steam coming up. But I can't use my refrigerator <laughs> or stove while that's yeah. occurring because the tripod is blocking all of that. And I don't want to move the camera around because I wanted to have that seamless effect when I, when I do the edits. I. The, the, all I, the stove scenes are my favorite. Okay. I, I totally understand. I've kind of, I maybe it's laziness, but I've given up. And whenever it does get that, and it's just going, I'm just like, oh, just let it foam up. I've been tempted to, to just edit up. <clears throat> well, I, no, I'm just going to leave him, man. I, I'm just going to leave him. Yeah. I, I, I do have one question because I'm, I'm curious. <laughs> Um, I really like your, your editing and I think it seems like you have experience in, in previously editing, uh, uh things. Yeah, I had a, I had a pretty good, uh, before doing this as a hobby, uh, my original hobby was photography oh, and okay. I was actually, I was actually fairly good at it. Uh, uh, won some awards, had some sales, uh, and all of that before I gave it up. Uh, so I was uh, fairly proficient with Photoshop, uh, from based on, on all of that. And basically all of that Photoshop experience just came back into play during, during this channel because of the thumbnails and all of the, uh, didn't have much work in video uh, editing uh, before doing this channel, but mm -hmm. everything just seemed to flow. Once, once you know the, the basics of Photoshop, you can pretty much apply that 
to make everything work. Um, but yeah. Do you edit in, uh, since you're in Photoshop, that's Adobe, do you edit in Premiere or are you doing stuff in? Nope. I had a copy of Photoshop that I, that I got years ago uh, before they started turning everything into a subscription service. This was a standalone Photoshop. Right. And it did everything I needed it to do. I didn't need all of the added extra new bells and whistles, the latest and greatest this year approach. So, yeah, uh, uh, yeah, Photoshop is it has a steep learning curve initially, but uh, uh, what I do, that's all I needed to do. Yeah. Okay, so I have one more little question about kind of your brewing method, and then I want to talk to you. You, you kind of hinted at um, some advice you give to at least YouTube bean makers. I, I'm going to talk about that in a second, but what other advice you have? So let's talk about yeast. Obviously, you said you have a couple of standards. You're a Red Star person, which is great. Of what? Do you repitch yeast ever, or do you yeah. always start with fresh? I always fresh. start with fresh. And since I use such <clears throat> small quantities of yeast per batch, only a quarter of a teaspoon, I mean, I'm getting I'm getting five gallons out of out of a out of, out of a pack. So uh, it, it tends to last quite a while. Uh, yep. So no, uh, repitching yeast. I mean, yeast is fairly cheap. Mm -hmm. At least here in the United States, yeast is cheap. Uh, I understand that there, are, there are those countries that uh, can't acquire wine yeast. And uh, they might want to repitch their yeast or try using wild yeast. And I tried to approach uh, that aspect by showing people how they can uh, produce their own wild yeast uh, for, uh, for grapes. It worked. Mm -hmm. It worked. It actually worked. It's not surprising. But it worked. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Um, so on that wild yeast front, that wild yeast are interesting to me because obviously they're very different from, from situation to situation. So, uh, have you ever tried to harvest a wild yeast or anything like that before? Uh, yes and no. Uh, when I did the original wild yeast video, uh, it was just that, see if I can make it. But I had about a cup of it left over and I put it in the refrigerator. I don't even know why I did it. I just did it. And then someone came up with the, with the idea of doing a wild yeast versus, uh, versus wine yeast video. And uh, I decided I had it. Go ahead and give it a shot. So that was probably the first, and I won't, I won't say only time that I'll, I'll reuse uh, uh, yeast of that, of that sort, but uh, the refrigeration appeared to have no effect on the ability of the wine. In fact, the wine yeast actually ended up outperforming the uh, commercial yeast, uh, mm. the, uh, the, uh, the wine yeast that I did, because I did a head-to-head -head video based on that. And that was one of those 30-day videos. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> uh, but uh, I was surprised with the results, and, and, and uh, yeah, if anyone's out there is going to try it, and that's the only way that, uh, or avenue that they have to make a wine based on where they are, yeah, it works. Yeah, well, and I, I ask that because wild yeast is um, it's finicky, and I, it, it obviously the, it is in the name. It is wild. You you don't mm -hmm. know anything about that yeast. Nope. And I've done a, a couple brews with wild yeast. And they're, they're quite fun, but you don't know any specs. You don't know if it's going to produce something good. Like you can assume it's going to produce <laughs> something good, but it, it's just, you have no idea. So when you find that wild yeast that works, I think that's where obviously people have cultivated to create the wine yeast we have now today or the, any yeast we have today, they took a wild yeast and domesticated it, so to speak. Well, I've seen people make it from, from apples, from, all sorts of organic food, uh, wild food that's out there. In my case, I went with organic grapes. I think the, the yeast would have been more or less uh, uh, associated with the, that grape making region uh, to keep things uh, fairly okay without a lot of uh, uh, questionable side effects to it. But uh, yeah, if uh, uh, no, I'll just leave it at that. Uh, yeah, if you if you can if you're making grape wine then why not use yeast that's inherent on organic grapes, so to speak. And uh, try and cut your losses that way, but uh, just simply mm -hmm. opening up a, 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 a container that's got nothing but uh, sugar and, and water in it and putting it near a window or a door and waiting for whatever yeast that happens to be in the air to float down and settle on it, along with everything else that might settle down. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> that's, that's too risky. I can't see doing that. It is that that is what um, is fascinating to me is there are people who 
who will do that, who will, you know, leave their open fermenter out in their backyard. And, and yes, you're catching wild yeast, but you're also catching everything else in the universe that yes. wants to find its way into there. Now, now I understand that's how wine was made for you know, thousands of years, but, uh, you know, times have changed a little bit. I yes. <laughs> keep up with the times. Uh, but, yeah, that's just, sometimes you really do have to look back. And uh, even though I, I try and liken my channel to how wine was made over the past thousands of years, um, again, I, and I'll say this once again, uh, I know wine can be made better by using additives. Simple as that. Yeah. It's the, what gets me are the people who are, are like, I would never, ever use a commercial yeast. And then they're like, that's, you know, the Vikings didn't do that. And then they get in their car and they drive to, you know, McDonald's <laughs> and eat a Big Mac. And I'm going, <laughs> what? Hold on. <laughs> this doesn't make sense. <laughs> so um. <clears throat> it is, it's quite entertaining. Let's talk about, um, I got a couple of random questions for you. What are, what's like the most challenging thing you have faced so far in your brewing career? Has it been a recipe? Has it been um, maybe a lesson of learning how to adjust things? Is there anything that you're like, man, this was a trial for me? I would probably have to say it was well, apart from learning how to wait for wine to fully develop to age, uh, to, uh, to mellow out, that was probably the hardest thing to do. Uh, following subsequent to that was learning how to make adjustments uh, to the wine, which is more of a, a growth process uh, it, more than anything else. Uh, because you really don't know how much of an actual adjustment to make. You're not there with... Uh, with with a test tube that's graduated and you're trying to get X number of millimeters uh, to add to a solution to, uh, to just making your wine adjustments. You're pretty much just saying, as, as using the lemon uh, analogy earlier, uh, okay, whole lemon just say it didn't work. Half a lemon is getting there, but it's, it's still a bit strong. Quarter of a lemon, give that a shot. It's kind of making those adjustments. Uh, that's really kind of hard because even though you want to have a great wine or me, Right off the bat, uh, my first need turned out pretty well. By the way, I still got a bottle that left. Um, you really don't know what to expect until it's done. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I still have a bottle of my first need. That's <laughs> hard because the first four <laughs> bottles were, were good. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that was a I, I never knew what need was until until I made that first bottle of need. It's like mm -hmm. need. What's that? You know, yeah. It's like, it's like a lot of people that I know. We have no idea what what lead was all about. Yeah, I agree. I think that that um, the challenge of understanding uh, balancing is is tough, and it is exactly what you said. It is experiential. It is not something you can learn always <laughs> via somebody saying, you know, throw this in. Like, yes, you can go and tell somebody a quarter you know, a uh, what a quarter lemon will adjust this acid balance, but they don't understand what it means to over adjust until they accidentally throw in that three quarter lemon and go, Ooh, that's a lot of lemon. So. Well, yeah, I understand that. But here's the thing though. Uh, when you're making wine just for yourself, yeah, you can make these adjustments and, and over time and everything is just great. But when you're starting to hand bottles of wine out as gifts to friends or competitions or collaborations where you really don't know, Who's going to say what about your wine? You try and look, you try and listen to what they're saying, uh, seeing if they're just being polite <laughs> or mm -hmm. if they're really going to tell you exactly what they, what they think about the wine so you can actually make adjustments. Um, but that's the point where I, I'm finally now beginning to give out my wine, uh, seeking it, how does it taste to you, uh, sort of thing. Um, how did that uh, wine taste, by the way? Yeah. Oh, it was great. I, so yours was really interesting. <laughs> which we're talking about um, a project that will, will be out by the time this video is out called the Great Mead Project. It is a giant collaboration between all the YouTube mead, I'll say mead and winemakers since you would, you're more on the <laughs> wine side. So uh, all of us kind of got together and agreed on three ingredients, which ended up being corn and mango and a pepper of sorts. 
And so we, in our own fashions, created these recipes, meads, um, and then did our videos for them and shared bottles, which I, I still have bottles somewhere in my universe. I've got too much stuff going on that I need to send out. Um, I just haven't taken the time to ship, but I, I thought yours was really interesting. And I, I watched your video. I've already seen your video. So I went through uh -oh. and, and <laughs> <laughs> yeah. so I watched your video and I, it's just, I love to see your process and how you do it. I did seeing how obviously I made mine and comparing ours in process alone was really fun. And, um, uh, hopefully I can send a bottle your way for you to try mine. But I thought yours was fantastic. And I liked your introduction of corn too. I, I did mine with popcorn. So that was a very different uh, choice than what you did. <laughs> 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 but it was great. It was great. Well, my choice again, as I explained in our last Zoom call, was that uh, uh, I was ground never made a corn wine. That was one of those wines that I swear I was, I was never, ever going to do on my channel. And uh, while looking around for recipes, and it's really not, I didn't really find a whole lot. I stumbled across one that was on the uh, U.S. Department of Agriculture. Mm. Uh, they had a recipe for corn wine, and that was pretty much how they said they made theirs. So I, I made the adjustment based on that. But, uh, yeah, it was, it was interesting making a corn wine uh, in my, once for, at least once in my life. So, okay, I've done it. <laughs> yeah. I started off my bucket list. You know? <laughs> Would you, are you going to make corn? Did it, uh, did it inspire you to attempt a corn wine again? Or are you like, you know, one and done? We're, we're out. Well, now that my channel has started to do a lot more interesting, bizarre, I think would be probably a closer word, uh, 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 winemaking projects, I might do a, another uh, a corn-based wine or corn wine. Um, I seriously doubt that I'll ever add any more hot peppers or pepper flakes to the wine. Uh, but, yeah, I can see myself doing a corn wine. Yeah, it was really interesting. And in, uh, like I said, I really would love to send you a bottle of mine because using popcorn was a very interesting and weird experience in that it, in, in how it tastes. It um, Did you actually pop the corn or did you actually use the corn? Really? Yeah, so I got, I had to buy, of course, um, unseasoned, unoiled kernels because of oil. We don't want to introduce oil in brewing. And I popped it into just a pot, essentially, and then did... I put it into a brew bag and just shoved it right in and let it sit there for like a week. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. And the, the weirdest thing about it is, you, you know, that uh, the aftertaste of popcorn where it kind of like it, obviously if it's buttery, then it has that essence, yeah. but that kind of, I can't quite explain it, but that the aftertaste of popcorn is apparent on this brew and it's a little funky. Um, but interesting, to say the least. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so that was, a, that was obviously a challenge for us. Um, no one's going to jump into the brewing world and do that. So what, what would you give advice to people who are wanting to start brewing? Like, what are, what are some things you wish you had known prior to starting? Um. There's really nothing that I can say that I wish I had known prior to start brewing, apart from the uh, uh, the waiting it out aspect, the aging aspect. No, there's nothing that I would say that should stop anyone uh, from going ahead and, and making your first batch of wine. Mm -hmm. uh, if you want to, if you want to do it via a wine kit, that's that's perfectly fine. If you want to do it just by watching uh, 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 the winemaking channels here on YouTube, that's perfectly fine. You'll find a, a a channel for every level of winemaking or winemaker mm -hmm. out there. Uh, but the, uh, the important thing is really just, uh, uh, just start and do it. Uh, uh, if you make mistakes, then okay. You, it's like everything else in life. You just learn from your mistakes and you, and you move on. Uh, that's probably the best advice that I can offer anyone. Uh, it's just, just go ahead and give it a try. What, yeah. can, what, can, what can go wrong? <laughs> what could go wrong? <laughs> so um on that note the kind of last question with you being such a beginner oriented channel what is the 
Do you have a starting recipe that you'd recommend people begin with? Obviously palettes are different, but is there one that you're like, this is just a good way to begin? Uh, yeah, I think we asked this question earlier. And uh, again, it, it remains the same. Uh, just going out and get you a, a two quart container of, of, of or, or one gallon container of apple juice. Mm -hmm. uh, the recipes are really pretty simple. If you've got a two quart container of, of juice, just pour off about a cup, add a cup of sugar, mm -hmm. <laughs> shake it up. <laughs> Uh, add, in, add in just a little bit of yeast and just uh, put your cat back on and wait it out. I mean, how hard is that? Seriously, yeah. that's, in, in principle, that's pretty much what wine making is. Juice, sugar, exactly. and yeast. Yeah. Well, I, I think that's great. And I really, <clears throat> I do love that your channel is so friendly to, to new brewers. And I think that is, is so important for us. Um, I, I hope my channel is friendly to new brewers, but I know yours is for sure because of how you, not only how you talk to people, but how you are communicating recipes in your development. And I think that's, that is great. I enjoy your channel a lot and I think your recipes are always very fun. And I have no doubt that everybody who checks out your channel is going to be able to learn something regardless if they're a new brewer or someone like me who's 200 deep into this world. So <laughs> I've, I love getting to watch your channel. I appreciate everything you do. Just don't watch my outtakes. <laughs> <laughs> Those are the best part. <laughs> Mine are pretty much obscenity filled. Uh, Total frustration. I, I, those are only reserved for, for, for our second tier members. <laughs> yeah. Those. Hey. <laughs> I think that's great, though. Um, I do want to promote our, as we kind of mentioned earlier, we have a project that's a, a collaborative project between us and all the other YouTube mead maker, winemaker groups. Um, it is called The Great Mead Project. And you can find Charles' video on his channel. It should be out by the time this video is out. And there are a collection of other YouTubers' uh, videos that will be around there as well. We all made the same, essential, essentially the same recipe, or I say ingredients, brew with our own styles. And it was a lot of fun. So feel free to check Charles' video out. And of course, check his channel out because He's, he's doing great stuff and I want to throw everyone I can your way. So thank you so much for your time. This has been a blast. Well, thank you for having me. Appreciate it. It's been fun. Yeah. So I, um, I look forward to seeing what you're going to post in the future. Again, everyone go check out his channel. I'll put a link in the description of this video and on the podcast, if you're listening via the podcast, but Charles, I hope you have a, a great day. I can't wait to see what you have up next for us. so thanks again i uh we will see you next time all right thank you very much <laughs> <laughs>